All right, um, and thank you all for showing up on a snowy morning early on a Saturday. Now that I've lured you here, I should probably admit that this talk has an alternate title, um, which hopefully we'll display in a second. Okay, we don't got that going on. Let's go here. Which is Confessions of an Unrepentant Nativist, which I hope will become clear the reason for this title as we continue onward. Um, I'm somebody, as Gary said, who studies language acquisition, right? I am primarily interested in how it is that children acquire the ability to express any possible thought that they have into linguistic terms. And mostly I'm interested in the semantic structures that underlie language. Now, of course, if you're going to study linguistic meaning, that means you're also bumping frequently into syntax. It means you're bumping into pragmatics as well. Um, but primarily, I've been interested in where the meanings come from. What this means is that, in essence, I've been trying to find ways to study the human conceptual system. Um, because one thing that we know is that every sentence that we utter, everything that we say, not only has a form, it's not only a string of words that's connected into syntactic constituents and that comes out of our mouth in phonological form, it also has a meaning, right? And it's this meaning of language that is probably the most difficult part to get at. Um, but I just want to point out that everything that we know about language is also true of linguistic meaning, everything that we know about linguistic form. Specifically, right, what you've probably heard again and again about language is that it has the capacity to generate an infinite number of forms from finite means. Now, since all of those linguistic sentences also have meanings, this means that the underlying conceptual system that language maps onto also is generative in this way. We're able to generate an infinite number of thoughts from a limited number of conceptual primitives, a finite number of conceptual primitives. One of the shocking things about the human conceptual system is that these thoughts are diverse in their contents. I don't know that we can express everything that we can think. Probably not, right? But we certainly can express a very wide range of ideas linguistically. Now, critically, the meanings of sentences also have to be compositional, right? Just in the same way that we have to be able to compose syntactic units out of words and the rules of syntactic composition, we also have to derive the underlying meanings of these sentences using the concepts that these words map onto and the rules of semantic composition. So what I'm going to be talking about today are these semantic structures. Um, and what I want to be clear is I'm probably going to bounce back and forth between using the words semantic structure and using the words conceptual structure. And it's, of course, an empirical and a theoretical question, the degree to which these two things coincide. But at very least, because we understand every sentence that we produce, every sentence that we hear, it has to be the case, right, that these sentences map onto conceptual meanings in some way. So I think that it is uncontroversial that the semantic structures of human languages have to at least be a subset or some sort of mapping off of the conceptual structure. And it's entirely possible that that's all there really is to combinatorial conceptual representations, at least these central ones that can tap into different contents. So I'll be going back and forth between these two terms, fully recognizing that the conceptual system may contain more than just the semantic system, but it must contain the semantic system at least. Now, one critical question for anybody who studies conceptual development, who studies language, or who studies the phylogenetic origins of language and conceptual structure, is where these conceptual representations come from. And there are a vast range of hypotheses you could have. I'm just going to make one cut through that conceptual space, right, through that theoretical space. One hypothesis that you could have is that our combinatorial conceptual representations are largely acquired by virtue of learning an external language, right? And here, every time I say language, I'm going to be referring to an external language, having the actual phonological system that allows you to express those thoughts, okay? And I'm going to do that because when many people say language, what they really mean is the underlying internal conceptual system that generates those thoughts. And if you mean that, well, the two terms mean the same thing. Right? So I'm going to use language to refer to an external system for encoding your thoughts, and I'm going to use conceptual or semantic for that internal representation. So the first hypothesis is that you do not have these kinds of promiscuous conceptual combinatorial representations until you acquire a natural language, and that natural language gives you the capacity to take concepts from different domains, concepts of different types, and link them together into these larger units. The second hypothesis is that these combinatorial conceptual representations precede language acquisition. 
And here I mean proceed both in an ontological, ont ontogenetic, and phylogenetic sense, right? Both in terms of ontology and phylogeny. Um, and this arguably has been the default hypothesis, second one, throughout most of the history of language acquisition. When I talk about acquiring a language as making mappings between meanings and forms, figuring out how it is that thoughts are expressed, I'm assuming that there's a conceptual system there that is expressing those thoughts, that is prior to acquiring the language. Now, of course, there's a vast range of hypotheses that fit into category two. That can include hypotheses where your conceptual system is completely innate. It can also include hypotheses where there's a lot of hard learning and work that occurs, but it occurs prior to learning the linguistic forms and not as a result of learning those linguistic forms. That's a cut I'm going to be making today. Now, I should point out that there are theoretical reasons for thinking that the second hypothesis is correct. And I'm just going to briefly go over those theoretical reasons for those of you who haven't been exposed to this ad infinitum. If you have, you can doze off for a few minutes and we'll come back a little bit later. I think one reason that's often not described is the phylogenetic reason. If we did not have combinatorial conceptual thought, right, an external language would be of little use to us. If we did not have messages to convey, a full natural language wouldn't have much to do. So you could easily argue that it's a phylogenetic prerequisite to developing external linguistic system that you have an internal system of thought. And this, for example, is very much lurking behind Chomsky's hypothesis or Chomsky's claim, right, that we actually initially developed language in his sense in order to express our internal thoughts. When Chomsky says language, he is talking about that internal conceptual system, not the external language itself. It's a precondition for the external language. All right, the second theoretical reason for thinking that hypothesis two might be favored is it is the only hypothesis under which we have been able to come up with a fully formed theory of how language is acquired. We'll talk a little bit about alternative theories later, right? But we do not have a hypothesis about how it is that you acquire things like word order or even word meanings that doesn't presuppose that these representations are already available to us. So if you folks over in cognitive development right, want to come up with a theory that says that language gives you conceptual representations, then you owe me a theory of how you learn language in the first place. Otherwise, you're just chucking your muck in my backyard, and I don't like that, okay? All right, the third argument is Fodor's argument. And this is the argument that you're going to need these combinatorial conceptual concepts for the purposes of hypothesis testing in order to get the system off the ground. And I'm just going to walk through those arguments for those of you who are coming into the field and haven't been introduced to this before. And I'm going to do this as a very simple dialogue between our unrepentant nativist and someone who's arguing for hypothesis one. So imagine we're arguing for the hypothesis that we acquire conceptual representations largely through learning an external language. Our nativists might ask, well, how do you do this? How do you acquire a concept via language? And typically, the simplest cases to think about are lexical concepts, concepts that are encoded in single words. Now, what our believer in hypothesis one might say is that that's simple. You just learn a label for the concept. You learn a new word, and now you're able to use that within your conceptual system. Our nativists might then say, OK, but given that you didn't have that concept, how did you figure out the meaning of that word? Perfectly reasonable request to make. And our empiricist here might say, well, you notice that the label co-occurred with instances of the concept. This has got to be true, right? This is how you go about learning words. You realize that the word dog occurs with instances of dog, so you are able to map the word dog onto a concept dog. Our nativists might say, OK, but how is it that you knew that those were instances of dogs if you didn't already have a concept dog. At this point, our empiricist has a couple of options, right? And probably the most frequent ones to say, well, maybe you built that a concept dog that allowed you to pick all of those things out as dogs from other concepts that were activated each time you encountered a dog, like furriness, floppy ears, tends to bark, and stuff like that. This is where things get complicated, because our nativists might now say, well, OK. That's great, but what are those other concepts? And what we hear most often from people who are arguing that conceptual structure is derived from language learning 
is that they'll get back to us later with a list of what those concepts are and the process for learning. And that, that's legitimate, right? We're in the middle of a science that we are building constantly, and you can definitely say that. Um, you know, what we're frequently tempted to do as nativists is start throwing out the other examples because dog is just the you know, surface, right? It's just the beginning of it. You're going to have to think about how it is that you would create concepts like not and 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 cause and agent and what possible primitives you could build those out of. So this is, in essence, Fodor's argument. If you are going to acquire a word, you're going to need to test a hypothesis about what concept that word maps onto, which means you have to have that concept at very least for the purposes of hypothesis formation. Now, Fodor's argument is not a knockdown logical argument. There are answers to this argument that you can make, um, and there's a really wide range of them. They probably fall broadly into three categories, at least the ones that seem well-formed to me, at least the ones I understand. You may have others. The first one is the one that is historically oldest, and that is the claim that our concepts, our work-a-day lexicalized concepts, are built out of smaller pieces and parts. The most classical version of this, the definitional theory, argues that there are a series of primitives that are necessary and sufficient for conceptual membership. As Fodor and others have pointed out, we've never gotten very far with the definitional theory. Another possibility, and probably a more productive one, is that we don't simply have a set of features that we add together to build bigger concepts. Instead, what we have is some sort of predicate argument structure, some sort of combinatorial machinery that allows us to build larger concepts that aren't simply feature addition. So, for example, we might have a small set of primitive predicates like cause, go, and become, and we may be able to combine those with a much larger open set of different properties to create larger conceptual structures. This is associated with the neo-definitional theory of verb meaning, for example, as instantiated by folks like Beth Levine, um, Hale and Kaiser, people from a really wide range of theoretical perspectives. And on this theory, there's a limited set of primitives that are interacting with a larger set of more sensory primitives to generate new kinds of predicates, for example. Those aren't the other only two choices you have, right? Another choice that I find at least very intriguing is the idea that what happens during conceptual development with respect to language is that we begin with larger amalgamations of concepts and then we break them down. What do I mean by that? Well, let's imagine that the system that our conceptual structure is feeding off of, building from, it doesn't get delivered to it little primitive things like cause and animal or go. Instead, it has a kind of natural unit that it's working with. And maybe it's something like a totally unanalyzed concept of dog or a totally unanalyzed concept of being inside of a box. And then what you have to do is take many different instances of things within and things with not and things with boxes maybe in them and break them down into smaller pieces. Smaller pieces that were given to us by some earlier system but weren't available to the broader conceptual system until words started to drive us to notice these commonalities. This is exactly the opposite of the first theory. Finally, Liz Spelke has proposed a perfectly reasonable, well-formed theory which argues that you build concepts, right, out of other concepts, but that they are not merely feature addition. Instead, what you're doing is you're taking domain-specific concepts and linking them together with words. They can't be linked together until you have a word to link things, for example, from the spatial realm to things over in the object realm. And so this is another kind of feature addition, in a sense, but it's arguing that those features are only combinable through language, available for hypothesis testing but for no other cognitive purposes, until you have a word like a little handle to carry them around the room. All right. All I'm trying to point out here is that Fodor's argument, while it's a good argument for thinking that we have these conceptual structures for hypothesis testing, does not rule out the possibility that there is conceptual change that occurs during language learning. Ultimately, what we're talking about here is an empirical question. To what degree are we actually seeing conceptual change that is associated with language learning, where language is driving us towards more and more complex concepts? Now, a large number of people at this conference are studying questions like this. Most often, they're studying them by looking at very young infants and trying to see what sorts of conceptual representations are necessary to describe their behaviors. Um, and that is noble work. That is hard work. That's difficult work. I kind of like easier work, so I don't do it that way. Um, I also have to admit that one of the difficulties of this work, right, working with young infants and trying to explain their behaviors, is typically when you're looking at any given one behavior, there are going to be alternative explanations for it at a lower level. And always a very open question of whether the kinds of conceptual structures that we're working with are really the sort 
that we think we mean when we're talking about linguistic meaning, when we're talking about full-blown semantics. Maybe there's a more domain-specific alternative instead. And so I think about what I'm doing as a complementary approach. What I try to do is look at how languages are acquired and created, and think about whether it shows the evidence of conceptual structures being constructed as the language develops, or whether those conceptual structures look like they were there before. And I'm going to tell you about two experiments that I think get at this, two natural experiments. And the first is going to focus on the phenomena of international adoption. So here I'm going to be looking at children who are adopted into a new linguistic environment during the preschool years and asking questions about how they learn their second language, language which will ultimately become their native language. So the basic thought here is this. If it's the case that we are constructing concepts as we acquire a language, then when we look at the course of first language acquisition, we ought to see the fingerprints of this, right? It should be the case that those concepts that are harder to construct take longer to learn. Those concepts that are easier to construct or available a priori take less time to learn. Now, when you acquire a second language, this should be a lot easier, right? Because you should have completed much of that work. Languages do vary to some extent in their lexical stock, but they have a lot of overlap. They have words for negation. They have quantifiers. They have words that pick out kinds, like dogs and cats, and prepositions. They have verbs. There's some variability here, but there's also, in the basic lexical stock, an incredible amount of overlap. So what we should expect to see is that these roadblocks that existed for first language acquisition are lifted or removed for second language acquisition. Consequently, the path through the language should look different. So let's think about what that path might look like and what kinds of phenomena we should focus in on. Probably one of the best studied phenomena in early word learning is the phenomena of lexical shifts over the course of acquisition. When children are first breaking into a language, young infants, their early vocabularies are largely filled with social words. Words that either refer to specific individuals or refer to whole social acts. Things like hi, bye-bye, up, meaning just pick me up, or mommy, okay? As they get a little bit older, you start to see more nouns creep in. So this is going to be words like horse, ball, dog. Still later, you begin to see more predicates being used, adjectives and verbs in English. And then you see closed class items growing as vocabulary grows even further. This particular data set comes from a sample of infants learning English, right? We're looking at their vocabularies over here, starting at under 50 words, going up to the point where they have 600 words in their vocabulary, as measured by the MCDI. And what I'm showing you is the proportion of words that fall into each of these categories. This phenomena, right, is incredibly widespread. So it's been studied in a large number of languages. The same basic shifts seem to occur in language after language, with some variation in the absolute proportions. So for example, children who are learning Mandarin early on do have more predicates in their vocabularies than children learning English, but you still see this shift over time, right? With more nouns early on, more social words early on. Now, you can't explain this just by looking at the frequency of these lexical items. If children were learning first the words that were mo most frequent, we would expect that they would begin by learning all the closed class items, right? Those are the most highly frequent words. English speakers should begin language learning by saying the. Even if we just limit ourselves to open class words, we should expect to see verbs being learned earlier than nouns if it was done solely on the basis of frequency. Verbs in general are more common. They have more tokens of a given type than nouns do. Nouns tend to be relatively infrequent. And yet kids are learning more nouns. So they're not just learning what they encounter most often, though frequency does have an effect. They seem to be learning certain types of words before others. So one question that we might ask ourselves, and people have, is what causes these changes in vocabulary acquisition? And this is a great place for invoking a conceptual hypothesis of the kind that I've been discussing. right? It looks like what we're seeing is that very concrete concepts are developing early. So the social words, for example, seem to refer to whole concrete events that the child participates in. The nouns refer to physical objects that they can touch that don't typically take arguments of their own 
and therefore have very simple conceptual structures. The predicates, well, they have to take arguments, so their conceptual structures may be more complex. And of course, once we start looking at closed class items, there we're frequently talking about second order, third order functions, things that are even further semantically more complex. So what you might think is happening here is that children are simply acquiring words in the order that they acquire the concepts, and this is driving the shifts that we see in vocabulary acquisition. There is, of course, an alternative, um, and it might be one that Lila may have referred to way back when she was here. And this is the notion that what we are seeing that's driving vocabulary acquisition is not largely caused by conceptual development, but instead reflects a phenomenon called syntactic bootstrapping, our ability to learn words based on the sentences in which they appear. And the argument here goes something like this. Imagine the child has all the relevant concepts that they need to learn this basic vocabulary. They still might not know all of these words at the same time or find them equally easy to learn because the kind of evidence that they need to acquire each of these kinds of words might be different. You may not be able to map the phonological form onto the concept until you're able to break open the rest of the sentence. And let me walk through exactly what Gleitman's account of word learning looks like. So I'm going to break it down into three stages, though there's no reason to think that these stages are discrete. My apologies. Okay. Oh, you guys don't see that. That's good. All right. Let's imagine a child who is just acquiring a new language. Let's make them an infant. They're acquiring their first language. And imagine for a second that they already have all of the concepts available to them. So accept hypothesis number two. This child, when they're trying to learn a new word, doesn't know any of the other words in the sentence. So if I'm sitting here going, blickety dax dorf goppel, right? That makes no sense whatsoever to the child. However, what they do have to figure out what a word means is my social cues. They have my eye gaze pointing. They can see objects in the environment. So if I'm going, oh, dax, dorf, right? You can look at that and you can figure out that I probably mean something about this computer. Those cues are going to be enough to allow you to learn concrete words like object labels, they're not going to be sufficient, though, for you to learn words like verbs. In fact, we put adults in that situation, and what they find is they can't actually figure out what the verb means. However, once you've been able to acquire a large number of nouns, the sentences that you hear are going to mean something very different to you. They're not going to be a set of, object or a set of nonsense words anymore. They're going to be a set of nouns in an intonational contour, and those nouns might point you in the right direction. So, for example, in this scene, if the child hears, man gorps you apple, they might be able to infer that gorps means something roughly like give. Having the other words in the sentence is going to allow them to home in on the correct concept here. What we have shown is that when you put adults in the situation where they have nouns and situations available to them, they can now not just learn nouns, they can also learn verbs that are concrete and relational. This should allow you to acquire predicates because you've been able to break open the language and start focusing in on those kinds of meanings. Now, if you've been able to learn the verbs and you've been able to learn the nouns, you should be able to begin to break open the syntax. And once you have these nouns and verbs together with the in the sentence and you begin to know facts about word order, then you're going to be able to represent the utterances that you hear as syntactic structures with known words in them. And this should allow for the acquisition of more abstract words. When we put adults in this situation, they can learn things like abstract verbs like think and know. So the claim here is that this is an alternative hypothesis about why vocabulary acquisition looks the way that it does. And these hypotheses, sorry, I'm having a problem with another program coming in. There we go. These hypotheses really make very different predictions about what should happen in second language acquisition. On the conceptual change hypothesis, where language learning drives you towards more complex concepts, what we should expect is that this bottleneck should largely exist just in the first language and it should disappear when you learn the second language. You should see more diverse lexical content later in life. If, however, the bottleneck is largely because of what you understand about the particular sentences that you're hearing, this bottleneck should reoccur any time that you have to learn language simply by being immersed in it and surrounded by those sentences. Now, this might not be a big problem for you or I, right? If we go plunking ourselves down into a new linguistic environment, we can go and look at a dictionary. We can talk to bilingual informants. But if we're young children and we're swimming in sentences again, four, five, six-year-old kids, we may have to go through all of the same stages in word learning that the infant has to go through. So 
My mission when I first started thinking about this was to try to find a population that was in exactly that situation, swimming in language. And the group that I focused on was children who were internationally adopted. And I was very lucky in doing this because a number of geopolitical factors led to a situation where there are a very large number of children who are being adopted into the United States in the early 2000s. So that's that blue bump there is the total number of children who were internationally adopted during this period is continued to drop um, due again to changes in geopolitical circumstances. And the vast majority of those children were coming from, or the majority were coming from either China or Russia. Those are the two smaller lines, the red and the green. Critically, many of the children who are adopted into the United States during this time period, and even more now, are children who are not at the age where they would be just first acquiring their first language. They're a little bit older. They've already begun to acquire one language, Russian, Chinese, right? And now they're acquiring a second language. So we have a lot of children who are coming in over the age of three. We already knew something about what language acquisition looked like in this population before we got started on this work. We knew that these children rapidly lost their birth language. Within about a year, even some of the older children, eight, nine, ten years of age, can say very little in their birth language. We see it disappearing within about six weeks in these preschool age children. And that's not surprising. There's no one who can talk to them in their first language. Why continue to use it? We knew that they rapidly acquired their adoptive language and that by um, adolescence, probably even middle childhood, they seem to show native-like proficiency. So we already knew that as well. Critically, the situation these children were in ensured that they had no access to bilingual informants and no access to text in their first language, allowing them to translate between the first and second language. So the participants in our study and most of the parents who adopt internationally typically learn between you know, two and ten words of travel Chinese or travel Russian in order to go over and do the adoption, which they no longer use with their children after they return. Some of these children are given language lessons a little bit later on when they're five, six, seven years of age. They might join a play group where they learn a little bit of Chinese again, but none of them that I've seen continue to have any level of proficiency. So in our studies, the children were all adopted from China and Russia. They were two and a half to five and a half at arrival because I wanted to prevent any of them from having access to text as a way of going between language one and language two. I looked at them during their first 18 months in the United States. Um, most of the action that we're going to see today is happening really in the first three to four months. And I compared them with infant learners to try to look at how these shifts happened over time. And critically, these infant learners are going to be matched to the adoptees on the basis of their vocabulary size. So I'm trying to catch children who are at the same stage of language acquisition and see if the same qualitative features are present in their vocabulary. And the idea here is that if it's largely driven by access to information, they should look the same. If, however, it is driven largely by conceptual change in early childhood, so for the infants, we should see divergence. Our measures were pretty simple. We used a parental report for vocabulary. We validated it with a videotaped language sample. Most of the data today I'll be showing you is from the parental report, but the two measures link up nicely. We also got information about their background and some information about their cognitive development, which I'm happy to talk about later if you like. I'm going to actually be smooshing together data from two studies. One of them was cross-sectional. One of them was longitudinal um, in design. The effects are very similar in the two studies. Um, and I'll also be talking about some unpublished work that will be scattered in there as we go. So, our working hypothesis here was that adopted preschoolers have any of the cognitive prerequisites that are necessary for early language skills, and particularly in this case, for acquiring the basic words of their vocabulary, the MCDI words. Why do we think that? They already did it once, right? These children were already producing multi-word sentences at the time they came into the US. However, they are in the same language context as the infant, and we validated that as well. So on the conceptual construction view, we should expect older children to acquire a more diverse set of words because they've already constructed the concepts. They should be able to dip in and get predicates um, and quantifiers and things much earlier. On the syntactic bootstrapping view, we should expect to see the same stages. You guys may remember that cumulative di the distribution graph that I showed you about shifting proportions for the infants. We can do the same exact thing for our preschool adoptees, and what we find is that there are no differences. We see the same shifts in vocabulary acquisition in this population. Now, of course, this is a pretty coarse measure. We're just looking at do they know predicates? Do they know nouns? 
It's much more fun when you home in and focus on individual words. What I'm showing you here is a graph of every single word on the CDI and the proportion of the infants who knew it and the proportion of the preschoolers that know it, right? Um, the bigger circles mean that there are more words that fall at exactly that point in the scatter plot. If the children are learning the words in the same order, you should expect a nice straight line going through there. That's in fact what you see, right? We're capturing, um, I think, about 70% of the variance here. I showed you a few words there so you can get a sense of which ones are learned early by both groups. There's mommy and dog. Which ones are learned late by both groups? Wood and so, right? And what we're seeing here is that the order in which infants learn words reliably predicts the order in which the preschoolers learn words. Now, because we have as many participants as we have and as many words, we're actually able to identify words that are statistically disassociating, right? We can say reliably that adoptees are learning them earlier or later than infants. And I think those are in many cases the exceptions that prove the rule, right? So here, for example, we can see that infants are learning the word playpen and the adoptees are not. I'm not going to attribute that to conceptual change, right? Preschoolers aren't in playpens, so they don't learn it. Similarly, pretty much as soon as they get on the airplane, our preschool adoptees learn the word coke, and we're not seeing the infants using that at all. Gum plays out the same way. This probably tells us nothing about conceptual development. It just tells us about the daily life of a four-year-old as opposed to a one- or two-year-old. But there are some interesting exceptions. You see up in that corner there? There's a cluster of words like tomorrow and later that preschoolers are reliably producing even at very early stages in vocabulary acquisition, but infants are not. And in a subsequent study, the longitudinal study, we looked at those in particular. And what we found is that, in fact, that was the case, right? The red line here is the percentage of those past and future terms that preschoolers knew at each vocabulary size, the black line is the percentage of infants that knew it. Here we're getting clear evidence that the preschoolers are precocious in learning words that refer to future times or past times. Interesting enough, this doesn't apply to time words across the board. If you look at time words that can be cashed out in the here and now, like now, or morning, or night, those ones show the same developmental trajectory. So this is a place where we may have some evidence for conceptual construction, or we may have some evidence for older children having more flexible word learning procedures that are allowing them to acquire this. I want to focus in on one particular set of words, and that's going to be the terms for negation. Uh, and this is work that I've been doing with Roman Feynman. So negation in children is produced very early. Children start saying no in most of the world's languages almost immediately. Um, as you'll see, 100% of our sample was saying no by the time their parents filled out the MCDI. Um, they also begin to use nonverbal negation very early, shaking their heads no, even before they can say it. However, there's evidence that the ways in which they use negation change over the course of development. Different functions for negation seem to develop over different time periods. So Lois Bloom argued that what you see in those early uses of negation is largely rejection. I don't like it. <laughs> right? What you don't see is what she called truth functional negation, where you seem to be using no to deny the validity of some other statement. So one example of truth functional negation might be if the mother says, is the ball gone? And the child says, no. Right? They're not saying, I don't want the ball. They're not saying, like, where is the ball? They're clearly saying what you indicated is not true. And that doesn't seem to show up until around about 24 months. Interestingly enough, in English, at least, the different forms for negation, for expressing negation, they also appear at different times. No is an incredibly early word, like I said. A lot of 12-month-olds, no, no. Not is occurring considerably later. On the CDI, it reaches 50% at around 22 months. And none is very late. It's not at 50% by the end of the CDI, I don't think. So we know also that there seems to be some relationship, rough relationship, between understanding verbal negation, even no used as verbal negation, and the production of not. Roughly at around the same age that children are producing not, that's when you're seeing them succeed at comprehension tasks that tap into verbal negation. Now, I say rough relationship because in individual children at 22 months, you don't see that those ones whose parents say they produce not are exactly the ones who are succeeding at understanding negation. But it is an awfully interesting coincidence that these two things seem to be happening at around the same time.
And this is not just because you need to understand not or produce not to understand not. This is the case even when the form of negation that is used in the study is no. Like, is the ball, on, is the ball in the truck? No. They don't show no sign of understanding that until they're producing not at roughly the same age. OK, so this is another case where we could have a story about conceptual change, and we could have a story about syntactic bootstrapping. On the conceptual creation hypothesis, we might argue that very young infants lack a generalized concept of negation. Maybe they have more specific concepts, like rejection. Their early uses reflect these more concrete, more complex concepts. Not complex, but maybe more amalgamated, right? And they only acquire or extract the abstract concept of negation when they learn the word not. And so they create it in this process. Syntactic bootstrapping would argue that infants do have an abstract concept of negation, but they can't map the word not onto that abstract concept of negation until they can pick apart the rest of the sentence. Because you know what? There's not going to be a lot of things that sentences would not have in common, right? Right now, I could say, you know, it's not raining outside. But would you know that from looking at this as a negation sentence, right? You have to know what the proposition is to figure out the relationship between the proposition and the situation. And that's going to require being able to understand the rest of the sentence. So to look at this, we did two things. First, we went into these transcripts of the internationally adopted children and their controls. And we systematically coded all instances of negation to see if we saw that shift that Lois Bloom talked about, where you begin to see more uses of what appears to be truth functional negation over language acquisition. The second thing we did is honed in on those words, no, not, and none. So here I'm showing you the results of the corpus analyses. What we're looking at here is MLU, centered on the mean MLU of our population. Over in blue, we have the adoptees. Over in red, we have the controls. And what you should notice is that there is an upward sloping line in both cases. What we are seeing is an increase in the use of truth functional negation in both of these groups, right? Now, what this suggests is this is not largely a function of age. It's not influenced by your prior linguistic experience. At least we don't have a reliable effect of that yet, right? What we do see, though, is that your linguistic competence seems to affect your ability to express negation or the kinds of meanings that you express. What we are also seeing in this population is that the words are acquired in the same order. This is the same kind of graph that I showed you for the total CDI vocabulary, but here I'm just looking at the words in the quantifier section of the MCDI, OK? And I've highlighted for you in red the three negation terms, no, not, and none. And what you should notice is that the proportion of infants and preschoolers in our sample who are producing those words is basically equivalent. They're happening in the same order, and it's happening right along that line. What this means is that vocabulary size predicts Right, whether you produce these words in the same way in both populations. And just because I know there's some quantifier geeks out there, I also highlighted a couple other words for you. Uh, same as for you, Jean Remy. Yeah. It also is showing this pattern. Um, interestingly enough, right, we're seeing roughly the same pattern with all the universal quantifiers that are there in green, except maybe a little precocity on getting each and every. Um, and I'd like to replicate that before thinking too much about it, but we're seeing the same basic pattern. All right, so the conclusion I want to draw from this first, uh, this first natural experiment is that when we look across the vocabulary with very few exceptions, we see the same order of acquisition in second language learning as we see in first language learning. And what this suggests is that there are no conceptual bottlenecks that are particular to the infant. The same process happens in preschool. I want to switch now to a radically different kind of natural experiment. And this is going to be evidence from language creation. And, and I'll see if you accept this argument, because this is not originally why we did these studies, but I think it's an interesting use of these studies. So let's go back to our hypothesis about where it is that conceptual structure comes from. If conceptual structure largely comes from learning an external language, if it's something that we're absorbing from the outside, a cultural practice that we're picking up, then what we should expect is that people who are not exposed to a language should lack these conceptual structures and the forms that express them. And if those people who are not exposed to a language begin to interact with one another, we might expect to see that these complex ways of encoding semantic structure, conceptual structure, take a very long time to develop. 
If this is discovery, if this is like mathematics or science, we might expect it to take generations to come up with things like relative clauses, quantification, or negation. Perhaps it should take many generations. So I got the opportunity to start exploring this with a graduate student, Anne-Marie Kakab, who came to Harvard many years ago, about seven years ago now, um, and who had been working on Nicaraguan Sign Language for uh, five or six years before that in collaboration with, oh, this is even better, in collaboration with Annie Senghas. Okay? And the broadest question that we have been asking together is just, where does language come from? Why is it that language has the features that it has? And of course, there's really only two possible stories, I think, for where it is that linguistic resources come from, conceptual resources or syntactic, right? One possibility is that we get our conceptual resources largely through our biology that is a product of evolution. And of course, to the extent that it was a product of evolution, all that evolution had to happen before the diaspora. It had to happen before ancestral Eve or ancestral Adam, because all human beings around the world seem to have these linguistic capacities. The other possibility for any given linguistic capacity is that it is arised via historical evolution. That sometime after our biological heritage was fixed, we began to work together in various ways to create resources that we passed down generation after generation and have come to be widespread because they have been acquired in this way. Okay? And of course, the critical time point here is the dispersal. That's when biological evolution has to end. So that results in very simple theories. If you believe that biological evolution was largely the driver of any particular ability, then it should be fixed and present in all human beings now and should have gone no changes with historical evolution. If, in contrast, you believe that an ability is completely attributable to historical evolution, well, then you might expect that if you were able to go back far enough, far enough, far enough, right, and look at the very earliest languages, the very first people, they wouldn't have that. It would emerge over historical time, right? after our biological heritage was fixed. Now, of course, there's going to be hypotheses in between, and you can imagine that it might be some of one and some of the other. The problem is, of course, that it doesn't matter which of these things is true, right? We don't have a lot of tools for going back and figuring this out. We can't go back and look at what languages looked like 70,000 years ago at the beginning of the diaspora. Why? Because our records of language really began about five or 6,000 years ago. When we do genetic reconstruction on the basis of language families, you know, maybe we can push it back to 10,000 years, but we can't get back 50,000. So we don't know about all of the cultural evolution that might have happened um, in the hundreds and tens of thousands of years in between. And so the solution we've been using to look at this is to look at situations where language creation is starting anew. And the group I'm going to be focused on today is children and adults who are using Nicaraguan Sign Language. So it's in a language that was created in a deaf community, like many other such languages. And it has been the object of study by Annie Senghas in the center there and her colleagues. Anne-Marie, again, is in the blue shirt above. Uh, and for about the last, uh, ooh, almost 30 years now, they've been going down to Nicaragua and tracking how this language changes over time. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of Nicaraguan Sign Language so you can understand the studies that I'm going to show you next. So prior to about 1980 in Nicaragua, there was no sign language in that community. There was no hereditary deafness, and so there were no village sign languages that sprung up. Instead, isolated deaf individuals lived in their towns, in their cities, with their families, usually without access to any other deaf people. And in this context, they developed what are called home sign systems. These are systems that children use to communicate with their parents or adults who are deaf use to communicate with community members around them. They really only have one native user, right? And that is the deaf person. Their families typically are not very fluent in using them. Um, and Marie Capola has done some wonderful work just showing how limited the knowledge of their families are. All right, what happened in the late 1970s, around 1980, was that the first cohort of children was brought together in a school for the deaf in Managua. Um, and this initial cohort was housed there at the school. Some of them came in on the buses. Some of them lived there. And they began to create a signed language. In the 1980s, about 10 years later, late 1980s, there was an expansion of this cohort as they brought more children in. They also developed a high school at that point. And so researchers who have studied Nicaraguan sign language have typically divided this into two groups at roughly 10-year intervals. 
There are the folks who are about my age who came in the 1970s. And then there are the folks who are, let's call them postdoctoral age, right? Um, maybe junior faculty age, who came in in the second cohort. And now there are other cohorts that have been developed, third cohort, fourth cohort. I'm going to use this cohort description because it allows me to sync up with the rest of the work in Nicaraguan Sign Language. But of course, in reality, this is a continuous process of people being added into the language community. What we have learned is that in many domains, right, New things that arise in the language with a given cohort, like say cohort two, do not work their way back to the earlier cohorts. There are exceptions to this, but by and large, for grammatical syntactic abilities, we do not see older cohorts using devices that younger cohorts have created. What this means is we have a situation where we can basically do archaeology on the language by looking at the people who are alive today. So if we look at the users of the first cohort, people who are in their 40s now, what you see is that they seem to speak a simpler form of the language than the people in the second cohort and the third cohort. In what way is it simpler? Well, what Annie Senghas has shown and what Anne-Marie has shown is that if you look at the home sign systems in the first cohort, they have a number of the properties that languages have. They have shared words. The first cohort has cardinal numbers. They have ordered narratives, for example. So some of the basics of semantic building blocks of language, they're already there in home sign and in the first cohort's language. There are other things that you only see arising later, and a lot of those are basically syntactic devices. There's no stable means of marking the subject or the object of the language, but you begin to see it emerge in the third cohort where you start to use spatial locations being used to organize sentences. You don't see ordinal numbers appearing until the second cohort. Complex temporal relations, like happening, one event overlapping with another but not completely, those aren't expressed reliably until cohorts two and three. I want to tell you now about two particularly critical linguistic abilities and when they arise in the history of Nicaraguan Sign Language. I'm going to begin talking about what is arguably the most controversial or fanciest aspect of language, the part you probably all heard about, even if you're not a language person yourself, and that is recursion, right? Recursion is one of the tools and techniques that allows language to make infinite use of finite means. Basically, recursion occurs whenever a rule can apply to its own product, and consequently, it allows us to build larger and larger sentences, larger and larger structures, by embedding one unit within another. And so if you are an English speaker, you may think about this as the house that Jack built phenomena, right? This is the cat that ate the rat that lived in the house that Jack built. This is the dog that chased the cat that lived in the house that Jack built. We can keep creating more and more complex structures by embedding each sentence into another sentence with a relative clause. Now, recursion has been argued to be a signature property of language. Some folks like Noam Chomsky have argued that is the core property of language that is universal and that is the only unique property of language. Other folks have said that when you look at some groups within the world, you do not see any evidence of recursion. So for example, Dan Everett is famous, among other things, for arguing that recursion is absent in the Piraha. I'm not going to get into the details of that debate. I don't study the Piraha. I can't really have an opinion upon that. Right? Um, I will point out that they mean slightly different things when they talk about recursion. For Chomsky, any time you stick two words together, you're engaged in a process that's ultimately recursive. I'm going to be focused more narrowly on rules that are cashed out in terms of um, more syntactic descriptions, like noun phrases within noun phrases, sentences within sentences. Now, one of the things that Everett has observed is that when you're using a language that does not have recursion, what you see is that recursive thoughts can often be expressed through non-recursive means. So he describes phenomena where people are talking about thoughts that would be expressed recursively in most natural languages, but they use a different form. So imagine you want to say something like, um, John's, sis John's sister, ha or John, <laughs> John has a sister that has a house, right? That would have a relative clause. That has a house is the relative clause. Relative clauses aren't present in Piraha. Instead, what you see people saying is John has a sister. That sister has a house. So they put two sentences together. They're next to each other. Right? It seems to suggest that the meaning is shared. But you don't, in fact, see recursive structure being used there. All right. So our question here is, where does recursion come from? The Piraha case suggests that it might not be a universal property of language. And that would be consistent with a story where recursion is a historical achievement. 
that maybe has built up over time and has simply become widespread. Of course, it's also possible that Piraha has simply lost many of the rules that were once recursive. Which rules are recursive in natural languages varies across languages. Maybe Piraha is just a boundary case where all of them happen to be non-recursive, even though the capacity for recursion is there. So if we think recursion is a basic capacity of individual human minds, part of the structures that we bring to language, this ability to think in this way, then we might expect to see recursion being present as early as home sign. We might also think, though, that recursion is something that arises due to how children organize linguistic input or how we pass down information to one another. In that case, we might expect to see it arise within a few generations. In contrast, if it's a cultural creation and one of particular complexity, it might take many generations. Now, one thing I want to point out is that in talking about recursion, we probably have to distinguish between different levels of representation. We might want to talk about what recursive structures are present. So take the sentence, for example, John knows that Mary knows that Bill lied. This describes, on the semantic level, right, one proposition, Bill lied, is embedded in another one, Mary's knowledge state, that's embedded in a third one, John's knowledge state. This is a semantic or conceptual representation. But this sentence also has a structure that is recursive. There's a syntactic representation that is recursive. It's entirely possible that we will find populations that have semantic recursion, the ability to think thoughts or build concepts with one inside of another, but don't have syntactic recursion. I think we also want to make a distinction between two kinds of syntactic evidence for recursion, which may occur at different levels of representation as well. In addition to semantic re recursion, and the syntactic recursion at the phrase structural level, there's also a question of how we morphologically mark recursion. English, for example, happens to be a language where we have relative pronouns. We can say something like, this is the cat, that ate the rat, that lived in the house, that Jack built. Recursive pronouns are kind of a weird thing. They're not in that many of the world's languages. They're in almost none of the world's sign languages. That's my understanding. So we shouldn't expect to see recursive pronouns everywhere we have sentences living within sentences. So that may be something that takes even longer to arise, something that has to develop over historical time. So how did we go about looking at this? Well, we ended up doing a elicitation task that was actually it was modeled on the very first thing I ever did as a psychologist, um, which was an elicitation task with young children to elicit relative clauses. Um, we validated this task with English-speaking adults and ASL users because it's really hard to get people to consistently produce relative clauses. And the task had the following critical features. So people were introduced to a situation where there was an observer, here the teacher, and three individuals that could not be distinguished solely on the basis of lexical items. So these are all boys, right? You can't just say the boy. You're going to have to be more specific about which one. All right. Next what happens is that you learn what these boys do, right? There's a boy typing, a boy writing, a boy reading. The teacher goes out of the room, and then something happens to one of these boys. Oh, no, right? What we see here is the boy that was typing fell. That's the sentence that we expect here. So the subject's job is to tell the teacher what happened while she was gone. In order to accurately describe it, what they're going to have to do is pick out one individual from a set and describe them and say what happened to them with an event. So what we expect is this would be a great elicitation context for getting relative clauses because you're going to have to describe one event in order to pick out a person and correctly indicate who's a participant in a second event. All right. So we expect something like this if relative clauses exist. There's a boy writing, a boy reading, a boy typing. The boy that was typing fell. If they have no relative clauses, and in fact using something like parataxis, we might expect something like there's a boy writing, a boy reading, a boy typing. He fell. Right? That would convey roughly the same meaning, but it wouldn't use a relative clause. I'm going to tell you about two of the three conditions that we ran. One is the one that I just described, where you have the set of three participants, and then one of them does something. We also wanted to look at what would happen when people are producing conjoined clauses, like the boy was typing and fell. To elicit conjoined clauses, we had just a single participant who did two things, and the expected conjoined clause was parallel to the expected relative clause. It had the same two verbs in the same order. Um, we also had a control for just verb repetition, which I won't be talking about today. So our prediction here for recursive utterances is that the meanings should be conveyed by giving a description of the critical event 
with the prior event included to pick out the target individual. We also had some predictions, though, for the morphosyntax. On the basis of field observations and some of what we know about signed languages, we expected that the verb within the relative clause, the embedded verb, typing, would be shorter than it would be in a non-embedded context. It was a referential verb, and we expected it to be shorter there because that's what Senghas had observed previously, and because lengthening is frequently a form of morphological marking in signed languages. When you do more repetitions of an item, right, you're oftentimes indicating that it's ongoing. So this will give us some visible evidence of the embedding. I'm going to show you now an example of one cohort three signer who is responding to this task. And you can see what she's taught, what the gloss is below. This has been slowed down. All right, what I want you to notice there, right, is that she produced the word eating twice, eating the apple. The first time when she was setting the scene, it was a longer verb. The second time, very short. I'm going to show you that again so you can see it. Okay? You're looking for eating the apple. Ooh. All right, so we got a gloss looks roughly like this in terms of the words that were produced. Girl read book, girl talk on phone, girl eat apple, girl eat apple take hat. It's that last underlined utterance, girl eat apple take cat, that is our perspective sentence with a relative clause. Those are the utterances that we're going to be analyzing. Now, first I want to tell you that we did see behavior in this task like we expected. We saw that Members of all three cohorts were setting the scene by mentioning all three characters. We also saw that almost all of the time, right, virtually 100% of the time, we were seeing them produce an utterance that included both of the verbs. So they were saying things like, boy typing fell. Now, what is not completely clear on this basis alone is whether they are saying boy typing fell or boy typing fell. Is it a conjoined clause or is it a relative clause? So, what we've got to do is look at those utterances to try to see how they differ from the utterances that we're getting, sorry, in the conjoined clause condition. So how is the underlying portion of that the same or different from what's happening in the conjoined clause condition? Because this will be our evidence that this, in fact, is embedding. That we have embedding going on at the syntactic level. So the first thing that we observed is that in the relative clause condition, the verb in the relative clause had been repeated. Let's just go back here for a second. Notice that you've already heard, in fact, you've just heard that the girl, who was, eating, the girl was eating the apple. And now you hear again, girl eating apple fell. This is good pragmatic evidence that the second use of the verb is not simply introducing the event that the girl ate the apple. You just said that. You don't need to say that. Its only function semantically is to pick out the right person from the situation. So to look at that, we compared the proportion of time that the verb was repeated in the relative clause trials, that's over on the left in blue, and in the conjoined clause trials. And what you should notice is that you never get verb repetition in the conjoined clause trials. They don't say that she was eating the apple twice. There's no reason to. But you're getting it pretty reliably in the relative clause trials. That is consistent with an analysis where it's recursion. In fact, it's precisely what you're not seeing right in the Piraha data. But we also want to go in and look for evidence of that shortening of the verb. So to look at this, what we did is we compared the first verb in the utterance, that's the putative relative clause verb, with the second verb in the utterance. And we looked at the duration of those verbs. We also compared the two uses of that first verb, so when it's in a relative clause and not. And what we saw is that the verbs are systematically shorter when they're in a relative clause. So this is the ratio of the first to second verb in the conjoined clause over on the left and in the relative clause over on the right. 
And what you can see is that these verbs are massively shorter when they're in conjoined clauses. So this all suggests, right, that we're seeing syntactic marking of this recursive relationship. Now, what we did next was try to look at whether these relative clause structures and meanings were being encoded by home signers. Because if they are part of our basic conceptual structure and that arises very early, we might expect to see that even there. So home signers continue to exist. Not everybody came into the community. And we collaborated with Marie Coppola at UConn to try to look at them. What we discovered when we gave the same task to home signers is that they basically did understand the task. They did produce utterances with both verbs in the relative clause condition most of the time. But these utterances looked essentially identical to the ones they produced in the conjoined clause case. We did not see repetition in either case. So no blue here. They're not repeating the verb even in the relative clause context. So the utterances they're producing look basically the same in the two situations, even though the pragmatic functions that they're serving might be different. Uh, there also was no shortening. There's three interpretations of what we're seeing going on with the home signers. One possibility is that they really do have embedded verbs, but no way of marking on the surface. I think that fails to explain why you don't see the repetition. So I don't think that's probably the most likely hypothesis. A second possibility is that they're unable to conceive of embedded messages. They're actually missing whatever you need right, to get that conceptual process going. That would be exactly what you would predict on the first hypothesis, hypothesis that I'm rejecting. Of course, this makes it kind of a miracle that within a single generation, NSL users were able to begin to develop syntactic means of expressing these kinds of relationships. Right? If they didn't have these meanings, where did the meanings come from? But I can't rule this out. The third possibility is that what we're seeing here is basically parataxis, non-embedded sentences that are used to express embedded meanings, much like what we saw in the paraha. All right, I'm getting my 10-minute warning, but I want to tell you just a little bit about a new data set that I hope stands on its own. And this is a study of quantification and how it arises in Nicaraguan sign language. Uh, quantifiers, if you don't study language, quantifiers are super cool. They have been absolutely essential to understanding the relationship between syntax and semantics and how messy it gets. Quantifiers are words that express relationships between two sets. So sum expresses the relationship that the two sets overlap. Some dogs bite people means that there is an intersection between the dogs and the biters. All humans are mortal means that the set of humans lies fully within the set of things that are mortal. No child enjoys being told what to do means that there is absolutely no overlap between the set of children and people who enjoy being told what to do, assuming there is somebody who enjoys being told what to do. All right, quantifiers create total chaos at the syntax-semantics interface, and therefore they're one of our best pieces of evidence that we actually need something like semantic structure. They are semantically complex because they take in two different predicates and return a truth value, more complex than anything else we've talked about, and they've been argued to be universal. What we already know about Nicaraguan sign language in the first cohort is that it has number words. And those of you who are language geeks probably know that number words are usually analyzed as quantifiers. But you may also know that number words can be analyzed in a way that suggests that they are less semantically complex than quantifiers. This may come as a surprise to you since number words don't appear in every culture. But they may be less semantically complex. Specifically, while quantifiers take two predicates or sets as their arguments, Numbers can, and some people argue almost always do, take a single predicate as their argument. So I can say there are two dogs. The only predicate that's being taken there is dogs, right? I cannot say there are all dogs. That just doesn't make any sense. So the argument here is that numbers actually may just be functions on a single set. All right. You might ask, where do quantificational concepts come from? And of course, we could pick our two hypotheses and put them to use here. You could argue that they come from learning a natural language. That would be a hypothesis of that first kind. Oh man, good luck with that. Because if you want to try to take the syntax and get to the underlying semantic structure, quantifiers are the absolute worst case for doing so. They have forced us to create all sorts of complexity between how syntax gets translated into semantics. But you're welcome to do it, right? If that's the theory you're running with, then you might expect that quantifiers are going to take a few generations to emerge. If they come straight off the structure of the human mind, then we might see them emerging very rapidly in a new language. What we've done recently is an elicitation study with 28 NSL users from the first three cohorts. And the setup of this is pretty simple. We first introduce a set of animals. So we show them this picture. This picture has a bunch of bears in it. Then we show them two different things that could happen. 
right? And these different things vary only in their quantificational relationship. Here, what we see is that all of the bears go swimming. That's the sentence we expect them to use to try to convey the person should pick the picture over on the right as opposed to the picture on the left where only some of the bears go swimming. We also, of course, had cases that were meant to convey other relationships. So here, none of the boys climb the tree. And we have cases like this where some of the birds fly or most of the birds fly. We were looking at three different kinds of quantifiers. Existentials, like some, or maybe most in this case. Negative quantifiers, like none. And universal quantifiers, like all or every. Here's what we found in terms of the production. So what we're looking at here is the forms that were suspected to be quantificational and where they were used across these different contexts. First, we're going to look at the case where we expected existential forms to be used, and we coded the forms that we had predicted a priori would be existential. And what we see here, whoops. Ah, good, you do see my data. What we see here is that across all three cohorts, 100% of the time, they are producing existential forms. Okay, so this is good. It looks like they have existential quantifiers. When we look at the negative context, we see something a little bit more complex. Critically, in all three cohorts, we are seeing negative quantifiers. We are also, however, seeing some existentials and some universals. Why is that? Well, there's a difference in what predicates they're using here, right? Some of the time, instead of saying, none of the boys climb the tree, they say, all of the boys are standing on the ground. And so, in fact, these are semantically appropriate, just not what we were predicting here. It gets even more confusing, though, when we look at the universal cases, because here what we see is that at least one of our groups, cohort one, is primarily producing existentials in universal contexts. So they appear to be saying something like, there are bears swimming, or some of the bears are swimming, rather than all of the bears are swimming. Now, to be fair, it's not the case that any of our participants seem to lack a universal quantifier. Only one participant failed to produce a universal quantifier over the course of the experiment, right? All the other participants produce all three kinds of quantifiers. So what this data suggests is that these classical quantifiers emerge very early in the history of a language. All but one participant was able to produce all three. However, what we did see was an interesting phenomenon where first cohort speakers are using existential quantifiers, quantifiers like some in universal context. For those of you who are pragmatics geeks, this is going to look a little bit familiar, right? It's not actually literally wrong to say some of the bears are swimming when all of the bears are swimming. Because when all the bears are swimming, there are in fact some of the bears swimming. It's just massively under-informative. Right? And so one possibility is that our participants are just failing to use the more informative term. Maybe because it's more difficult for them to retrieve, right? or maybe because on some level they don't recognize the competition between those forms because they don't retrieve them quickly enough. I think there's another possibility, though, or maybe a complementary possibility that explains why it is the universal might be harder for them than the existential. You remember how I told you that you can analyze numbers as really just taking one predicate rather than taking two? Well, you could actually analyze our existentials in the same way. It might be that what we're seeing here is something more like several of the bears are swimming. Several can easily have a meaning where it doesn't require two predicates. There are several swimming bears, right? In this case, we wouldn't need to analyze it as linking together two sets, and that might be what makes it more semantically difficult. All right, just to summarize, we saw two forms of evidence against external language as a source of conceptual structure. We saw that early acquisition of a second language looks roughly the same as acquisition of a first language, suggesting there are no bottlenecks that are specific to initially acquiring the conceptual structure. And we saw that many of the core conceptual distinctions encoded by natural languages can emerge within a single generation. But there's still plenty of things to keep us all busy and um, plenty of reasons to think that language learning might play a role because every case study we look at, every concept we look at might be different. Some of them may be constructed and some of them may be given to us prior to learning language. We saw, for example, that time words referring to future and past events are a good candidate for construction. Number concepts are another example that have been argued to be constructive and are absent in home science systems. So there's still plenty for us to do. Thank you. <laughs>
We have time for questions. Otavio. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. It was very good. Um, so I have a question uh, about this distinction you make between the conceptual maturation and uh, the syntactic bootstrapping. I'm completely convinced about the syntactic bootstrapping, but I'm, I'm not sure if to what extent uh, your presentation, ho uh, uh, your presentation goes in the direction of rejecting the other hypothesis. I wonder if a mixed model wouldn't be possible. You know, you have both syntactic bootstrapping and, and, and conceptual maturation, and then uh, you, you find what you found. Okay, so I think one version of this question is, um, I have shown you that you do not need to invoke conceptual change to account for the pathway of early word learning. You can completely account for it on the basis of syntactic bootstrapping. Um, and that's also consistent with the human simulation studies that I did with Lila and that she's continued to do, right? Um, but you could say, hey, actually, I believe in both things. They're not mutually exclusive. So why couldn't it be the case that first language acquisition is influenced by both conceptual development and syntactic bootstrapping, and second language acquisition or word learning in adults is only influenced by the information that's available in the sentence? And what I would then say is, OK, but what evidence do you have then for conceptual construction occurring during this time period? Because you can't look at the vocabulary itself. The vocabulary acquisition trajectory is no longer evidence for it. It's completely explained by something else that we know must exist. right? Um, and so it's true that you could have those two things happening exactly the same, such that they completely mirror each other, and when you remove one, the system is identical. And I cannot rule that out. I'd have to look to other things. And I would look back to those logical arguments. I might also look to the case of Nicaraguan Sign Language, where there is no evidence in the external language. Yeah. Thank you for uh, this great talk. Uh, I have two questions about uh, the adoption studies. Yes. So you showed us a strong correlation between infants and preschoolers CDI over time. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was uh, wondering whether that correlation uh, also holds for like relational words like verbs and prepositions. Yes. And uh, I also have another question about cross-linguistic differences. So you said that languages are largely similar in terms of concepts, but uh, so there are some critical differences between languages, like some uh, speakers of some languages, for instance, like Turkish, Finnish, may rely more on uh, morphological cues instead of syntactic cues. And so would you expect or uh, do you have any evidence for different courses of acquisition of the second language for similar and different languages? Okay. So um, a couple of things are packed in there. First, your very first question is easy to answer, right? Which is I didn't um, home in on just verbs or just adjectives and show you the correlations for those items, but they do look basically the same, right? And they were included in that pink graph. Those are the ones that are kind of coming in the middle there, the adjectives and the, and the verbs. The next thing you point out is that, of course, there are cross-linguistic differences in how concepts are expressed. And I think that's relevant. There's two ways in which cross-linguistic differences might be relevant. First, in terms of the story that I was focused on today, do you use language to construct concepts? The kind of cross-linguistic difference that would be most relevant is whether the concepts that are encoded in the early vocabulary differ across the two languages. And to a first approximation with just a few limitations, I think that is true of the two groups that I'm looking at, right? So most of the children, actually all the children in these studies were either coming from Chinese languages or they had been learning Russian or Ukrainian, right? Most of the words in the CDI, with the exception of some of the closed class items, have direct translation equivalents. And so we're not seeing a lot of words there that you would not have had to have constructed in your first language. Now, that doesn't mean they're the most common words in that language, right? It doesn't mean they're not other words that don't have direct translation equivalents. Second, what we do see differing massively right, across these languages is how these concepts are encoded syntactically. So you bring up the example of Turkish, we're going to see a lot more happening morphologically rather than in these um, free-floating closed class items. Right? And so we might expect that you're going to have an easier time learning those things that are encoded in the same way in your first and second language than you're going to have in learning ones that are encoded in different ways, for example. And that was the reason 
one of the reasons why we looked at both the Chinese population and the Russian population. We expected to see some systematic differences there, right? The Russian children had been learning a massively inflected language. The Chinese children had been learning a language with almost no inflection. We don't see any differences. We have yet to find a reliable difference between the children who are coming from China and the children who are coming from Russia. And we have yet to see a reliable difference between them and their English controls at this very young age. What I will tell you is that I have an unpublished analysis and data set that I've been sitting on for a long time. I shouldn't be sitting on this long. Um, where I look at slightly older children, children who are about four or five, and just focus in on those kids. And what I see there is that it looks like the children coming from China may be doing a little bit better with the verbs. Um, this is also the age at which we start to see the children sometimes doing direct translation when they're sitting there playing with the toys in our videotapes. And so I think there's some more thinking to be done about that and what it might mean. Now, it's not compatible with the conceptual construction hypothesis. Because it was, if it was constructing those concepts that gave you the leg up, then we should be seeing that change happening in our two and three-year-olds as well, who have also learned those basic verbs. But it may tell us something different about the language acquisition procedure in slightly older children. Um, I should also say I haven't closed in in a very fine-grained way on things like the encoding of definiteness and indefiniteness. Right? That should be really different across these languages. And I think that's because the CDI data is really not going to be sufficient for me to look at those. I'm going to have to go in and look at the transcripts in the same way that we have with negation. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, uh, I just want to, uh, uh, it's, it's a technical, so despite your introduction, you are not defending a Fodorian kind of nativism about concepts. I mean, you say quantifiers, negation, and recursion, that these are one thing. And I'm, uh, uh, on the other hand, dog, violin, or airplane, or something like that, uh, we have a much more economical story about how those concepts might be learned than uh, assuming that they are all innate. Like there's these stories about uh, what the uh, learning story goes like, nomological locking to kinds is learned basically based on uh, perceptual recognition, essence placeholders, and early uh, heuristics that children apply in word learning. So that, that sounds like a more, more plausible story about uh, the acquisition of the second class of concepts than, uh, than assuming that virtually an infinite number of possible kind concepts are innate, right? Would you agree yeah, with that? Yeah, so let, let's pull apart. I, I think Fodor makes two arguments that are only loosely linked to one another, right? His first argument, which is a logical argument, is that you must have a concept available for hypothesis testing in order to learn that concept. And I think he is absolutely right about that, which makes, in some sense, the learning of concepts vacuous. Yeah, there's, um, some there's some ways of rescuing the, va the vacuity there. I um, mean, they may be really relevant to understanding the kind of data that we generate here. For example, what you uh, generate for hypothesis testing may not be available for um, entry into larger conceptual combinatorial processes until after you've solidified that hypothesis. So there could be all sorts of access issues. OK, that is where I'm completely with Fodor. I think he's got that 100% right, and that's the sense in which I am a radical nativist. OK, another thing is that Fodor now says, well, given that this is true and no one's ever really been able to come up with a good definitional theory, I'm going to commit to atomism. That argument is not a logical argument, right? Some people have called it an argument on, fail on the basis of the poverty of the imagination, right? That because I can't think of anything, I'm going to go over here and go for atomism. That, that's where I think he's just wrong, for many of the reasons that you just stated, right? And I think I've already kind of tipped my hat to the fact that I'm pretty comfortable with something like a neo-definitional theory of verb meaning. And I wonder if something like that, right, a primitive set of predicates that operates over an open class of perceptual experiences could get us pretty far in other domains as well, um, and, and very comfortable with the notion of essence placeholders, for example, that has a very similar form. Yes? Okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I would like to ask you a question that was asked uh, to Chomsky at the Chomsky Piaget conference. Uh, it's a meta question. So he was asked, uh, well, let me put it directly to you. Uh, uh, g given the strong arguments for the position you defend, which I personally find quite convincing, uh, how is it that it meets with such resistance? How is it that a large part of the relevant community uh, uh, thinks this is totally misguided? Ah, I think this is a sociological question. It's an interesting one. Um, so, uh, you know, my sainted mentor, she says that uh, empiricism is innate. And I think she's right, <laughs> right? Um, there might be really good reasons why we are biased to think that we learn things. First off, the things that you learn, you may think they're the things that you can change, 
right? So maybe we're biased to think that effort is going to lead us to change. Maybe it's, you know, go in the Carol Dweck direction, right? Maybe what this is is a way of becoming good masters of, of different things. Um, there's, of course, the Western tradition of reductionism of various kinds. This allows us to relentlessly reduce, and we like that. There's the fact that people like to have something to do. Right? We are developmental psychologists. We study development. We would like to think that there is something happening that is interesting. Otherwise, what exactly are we doing here? I, I mean, I think we're doing some really valuable and useful things, right? And I think nativists have to make a good argument for why what we're doing matters. Um, but for example, if you think about language acquisition, arguably one of the most uh, nativist hypotheses that was ever introduced was Steve Pinker's semantic bootstrapping hypothesis. And one of the really frustrating things when you read right, that book is it basically Pinker says by the end of it, yeah, you know, all of this is probably over before the child begins to speak, so you shouldn't be able to see any evidence for my hypothesis. It's like, oh, if you're an empirical scientist that makes you just want to pull out your hair, you'd love to think that the things that you can see are actually telling you something about something important. Okay, then. You know, we're not operating in a vacuum. One of the reasons why many people in this room and many people in this community believe that language is critical in the construction of concepts is that they observe phenomena where learning a word or teaching a word leads to a change in behavior, right? And that on the face of it looks like evidence for conceptual construction. I think they have a number of outs, right? One of my favorite theories is the kind of theory that Yvonne Krupen was giving just the other day where he said, you know, what language does is allows you to point people in the right direction, right? It allows you to give them pragmatic information about what the task is about. Another pet theory of mine for those kinds of cases is the access theory, right? That once you've got a word, it's not that you have a new concept, it's that you suddenly have better access to it, you can hold it in memory, you can use it for more things. That is conceptual change of some interesting kind, just not the kind that I'm talking about today, right? It matters for all daily living purposes. Hi, thanks for the great talk. I, I think I might have missed this, but I was very interested in the late developing um, of the time words. Um, were you arguing there that this is evidence for um, actually the, the late developing concepts, so the idea that the hippocampus is developing uh, over a longer time course, that actually in behavior, you know, four or five-year-olds are the ones that are doing something different with regard to past and future? Therefore, they do, they do need to be older to have the concept to then learn the word? Or was the argument that this might be a case where language input is helping them to develop that concept? So one of the unfortunate things about my paradigm here, my natural experiment, is that when I see the exact same thing happening in the two groups, then I can very confidently say that this has to do with acquiring a specific external language. When I see a divergence, there's a number of possibilities that are open to me. One of them is that language is involved in the conceptual construction, right? That's certainly possible, given the data that I just showed you. But it's not the only explanation that would be consistent with that data. Another possibility is that the concepts themselves, as you just floated, right, aren't available until a certain biological age, and at that point, you then begin to have them. Actually, I think that's an attractive hypothesis for the time words. And the reason for that is that this is a case where when children initially produce them, they don't produce them with the right meanings. They seem to be off in terms of what they mean, right? So there's been some lovely work coming out of David Barner's group um, and much earlier work. Uh, Catherine Nelson did some of it, showing that children's early use of time words is actually really confused. They use words for the future, for the past. Um, oh, my son, who is probably toned out there and listening to his, oh, yeah, Oscar. OK, Oscar, when he was between the ages of two and three, had one word for the future, which was after nap time. Right? Mm -hmm. This is a pretty common thing for children to use a single word to refer to all of the units going forward. So maybe they haven't been able to divide up time into the right kinds of units. Some of those units are culturally constructed. So it makes sense that that might take some effort and some work to do. You might have to build it up over time. Of course, there is another possibility, which is that they may have the concept of tomorrow right, or yesterday, but it may be really tricky to map the right word onto the right concept because the event happens so far in the future or so far in the past that you're a little bit fuzzy on exactly which event it referred to. So it could be that these older children just have better memory. But I think a lot of things point towards this one not being um, a form of syntactic bootstrapping, right? The fact that actually long after they get the syntax and they're using them in perfectly linguistically appropriate ways, they're using them with the wrong meanings. So they really are outliers in terms of our understanding of lexical acquisition. Hi, I, I'm over here on the, yeah. Um, so I actually had the same question about the same thing, so I'll just add something to that. It seems to me that the case of those time words 
could actually be something that's really about linguistic input, even if it's not about syntactic bootstrapping. Because um, you, you tried to argue that these were different from the playpen and the Coke examples, but it seems to me like it could be, can you not hear me so well? I, I missed that last sentence. You, you tried to argue that these are not like the playpen and the Coke examples where yep. you do find divergences, but it seems to me like it could be the same type of thing because the ways that parents talk to their children are going to differ across development. So perhaps parents think that children, when they're preschoolers, can participate in planning events and remembering events better than infants can, even if infants do have those concepts available to them. Yeah, and I haven't seen any difference in the input samples that we have. They are sparse input samples, so I could be wrong about that. There's another subset of words that popped out in one of my analyses where I think that's exactly the right description. Some of the adjectives for the child's own biological states appeared to be precocious in the preschoolers. These were things like hungry, tired, right? And it did seem intuitive to me that if you're in newly introduced to a four or five year old, you might be asking them, are you hungry? Are you tired? You know, you're kind of an anxious parent. You're just jumping into the situation. Whereas I think most people who have been hanging out with a baby are not going to say that a lot to a one and a half or two year old, right? They're like, I know when you're hungry or tired and I take care of that. Um, so I think there may be input differences, but I don't know if I have a large enough input sample yet to address that. Hi, thank you. So I've been wondering if the first set of experiments is compatible with, a, with an extremely strong version of the language first hypothesis, where, you, where your concepts basically depend to some degree to the language you use. So whatever pattern you have with, uh, when you are with your first language will be reproduced because you have to basically learn new concepts with the new language, unless you have a meta theory on language and how you can translate concepts to each other. So let me see if I understand your hypothesis correctly. Um, this would be a theory where you engage in conceptual construction first time around, but then second time around you completely ignore everything that you constructed the first time, and if you have to reconstruct the same concept in language two, you show no savings based on what you did in language one. Is that right? Basically, yes, but not because you just want to ignore it, but because what conceptual development is, is creating these words and labels. So the distinction between lexical items and concepts is not meaningful before you have a theory about this mean, being okay. meaningful. So your system, set, your system doesn't, basically the lexical item and the concept are stuck together such that the created concept can't be pulled out and linked to another lexical item. Yeah, I think that, pr that predicts essentially the same thing that I saw. Now, there are other versions of that that don't predict the same thing, right? So if you believed that the reason why you had to go through the same exact set of steps in the second language was that those are by and large new concepts, then we should be able to pull apart those ones that are and aren't new concepts and see differences across them. And that's what I've tried to do, and to the extent that I've been able to do it, I haven't been able to. Um, yeah, I gotta think about exactly how we would get at that, because it, it does predict an exact isomorphism. Okay, the last question um, over there. Yeah, so my question is similar as the previous one, so I'm just curious about how uh, the relationship between language and concepts, how do we know that the two uh, domains are closely related to each other because uh, the acquisition of language and the acquisition of concept are they truly linearly or in a one way or another parallel and because we can express concepts not only in language but also in joining music and these things are all universal um, also has uh, have the properties that uh, you know, shares among different uh, social groups and uh, uh, similarly um, have historically developed uh, as language does. And if not, if this is the case, then how can we use uh, concept to test the language acquisition and vice versa? So could you please explain okay, a little I'm gonna bit? I'm going to try to unpack that question, but I do have to admit that I'm having some problems understanding it, right? Oh, okay. I think I'm having problems understanding it because I don't find similarity to be a particularly useful theoretical construct. 
There are certainly things that are similar between the concepts that are invoked in language and the concepts that might get linked up with, um, certainly with drawing. I would, I would push back, I think, actually against the music case. I think we're dealing with some very different kinds of conceptual primitives, but maybe some of the same combinatorial apparatus, right? Um, and I'm also having problems grappling with exactly what you mean by saying that these things are happening in parallel. Because it seems like there's, there's going to be very different stories about how they're linked. Here's what I am strongly committed to. Right? Our best evidence for a productive combinatorial conceptual system comes from the fact that we have sentences and those map onto meanings and those sentences are an infinite set. So I know that whatever else is going on in the mind, there is a combinatorial system that encodes the meaning of utterances. Do I know what else that combinatorial system is used for? No. Right? I know that I can definitely use it to encode my own thoughts, and I can have those thoughts in relationship to drawings. I can have those thoughts in relationship to music. They don't express that combinatorial structure in quite the same way. Right? So I am not claiming that we exhaust all of our combinatorial apparatus with language, nor am I claiming that we don't tap into language for understanding those other things. Okay, next. There is still a legitimate question about whether acquiring a language is what gives us that combinatorial structure. You're yeah, that's actually my question. Yeah. Well, that, that was my question too, yeah. <laughs> and what, what I was arguing was that I think there's good evidence that is not learning a language that gives us that combinatorial structure. And I think that evidence comes from the fact that second language learning looks the same as first language learning. And critically, that people who do not have a language model create many of these forms in the linguistic systems that they devise, sometimes within a single generation, sometimes within two or three. I think that should come as good news, right, or as compatible with your worldview as far as I understand it, right? Because I think what you're saying is, hey, it looks to me like concepts get linked to all sorts of things, so why make them be solely linguistic? And so that, that certainly seems compatible to me. Okay. So I have several follow-up questions, but we can dis uh, discuss it offline. Thank Different you. Time, okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you.